hello and hello. All right. Thanks for showing up or thanks for pressing play, as they say. My name is Jerry McNamara, the host of the Best Places to Lead show. And we are on a mission to positively impact 5 million people over the next four years. And, you know, as I really think about that, it's been super fun. We just crossed over 50 episodes. The amount of learning that I have done in thinking about how we create compelling companies, because compelling companies always outperform, and how do we make sure that our people feel so loved in the work that they do every day and contribute to our success and the company's success. And so that's really what we're here for, to share those insights, because I really believe that we are better together. And so I'm going to take us through last week. So if you didn't, if you missed last week or you haven't listened to that episode, I would encourage you to go back because we talked about the importance of frameworks and frameworks really are the scaffolding to building a great company. And today I'm going to take you through, let's just call it the decision making addition about how great companies can ease the leadership burden by sharing these frameworks with our people, with our companies, so that we can make consistent decisions. And so super fun. Craig Besky, my best friend, good to see you here today. It's going to be a really good one. So let me get here. We're going to share the screen. So I said the decision-making addition, we're going to do a bunch of these. I think over the course of the year, I'm going to really be thoughtful doing deep dives about the leadership competencies. I've outlined 11 of them. Decision-making is maybe or arguably the most important. And so what I want to do is share with you a framework that I've developed around decision-making, the elements of what this framework should look like for you as you tailor it for your company, and just get you some things to think about. So let's just start with why frameworks. Frameworks are super important because they create consistency across your organization. You want to frustrate your people, make a decision one way one day, and another decision differently the next day. And so we want to be consistent with uh, the things that we do. Uh, frameworks remove complexity. They create order for us. Everyone is on the same page operating from the same sheet of music. That's a beautiful thing. I just finished a strategic plan for a company this week that's doing great gangbusters. The amount of alignment that happened over the, the course of 24, 48 hours working together was extraordinary. It also allows us to iterate and improve over time. When we've written something down and we've said, here's how we do it, it gives us a chance to be thoughtful and considered on how we can do it better in the future. It also erases the mental burden of leading. Everyone always says leadership is hard, it's stressful, it's lonely at the top. All of those things, all of them are true. However, we can do this better. And so that's what I want us to think about. And then again, we make logical decisions. They're made in advance when not under emotional stress. When we do that, we just ease the burden for all of us. And at the end of the day, because companies don't want to stay stagnant, scaling and speed are possible when the rules of the game are clear. And so if we can go ahead and get clear on the rules of the game for our people, we are in just a much better shape. I'll remind you of the leadership, what our responsibility is. So when we think about great organizations and ones that succeed in recessions, they drive the vision, the values, and the objectives to the front lines of the company so that people can make agile, engaged, and autonomous decisions. Let me say that again. What we do as leaders for our people is to create a predictable environment so that our people can make agile, engaged, and autonomous decisions. They're not dependent on us. They're not little robots that go go out, get information, come back, ask questions, right? This is not chat GPT for leadership. This is actually moving the organization forward by creating clarity. And the reality of it is, and, and you think about this, you may be inherently clear on these frameworks, but are your people clear? And that's the point. Clarity is kindness. And it also allows you to take a vacation without your phone ringing every five minutes, people asking you. And so, that's what we really want to do. So frameworks, where do you start? I'm going to start with decision making. That's what I want to teach on today. So here are eight elements of a decision making framework. 
The first one is we have to determine, is it important? There are so many things that come to your leadership team. You have to determine whether, is this even a, a decision that is important enough or warrants leadership type decision-making? The second is we have to get clear on the problem. What problem are we solving for? There are so many times that I see companies argue from so many different points of view, and we're not even sure about the problem that we're trying to solve. So let's get clear on the problem. We have to be clear on the outcome. We want to be clear on the problem. What is it we're trying to change? Then we have to generate options. Once we know, hey, we see this as a problem. Here's where we want to go. What are the best ways to do that? We have to create options on that. One thing that I also think that's important is an overarching philosophy about how we approach decision making. And I'm going to share with you Red T. Holmes and Nathan Adams. We worked through a decision making philosophy at their company, and Nathan gave me permission to share that with you. I think if you have an overarching philosophy, it makes the rubric that we use for decisions even better and easier. So then we actually have to make the decision. So what are the steps we're going to go through to make sure that we've picked the best option to create the best outcome on the clear problem we're trying to solve? Then once we do that, kind of a fun thought, we're going to red team the decision. And then the last piece, because we want to iterate on all of these things, we're going to record key decisions so that we can be thoughtful about them. So let me take you on that journey. So first, Bo Su. I, I introduced Bo. He's the world debate champion, smart guy. Go. He released a book at the end of the year in 2022. And I've listened to him on a number of podcasts. He is one smart cookie. And so he, here's the first hurdle we have to get through. Is the decision important? So let's think about this. Is this real or is it just perceived? Has it actually happened or are we concerned that it might happen? So that's the first step. Let's answer that question. Is it important to the company? So, hey, Silicon Valley Bank went out of business. That was big news. It was not important to me. I didn't bank there. My banking relationships are safe and secure. And so no impact to me. So is what we're talking about important to the company? Third is, is it specific to be solved? Or is we are we talking in global things? Because when we say like, oh, we have a, a disengagement problem inside of our company or a connection problem, that's very global. It, it, it just incites fear. But let's get real specific. I saw this one thing happen in this situation. What's happening there? And so let's be really specific about what's happening and what needs to be solved. And then is it aligned to the company or is this someone individual, how it's impacting them? So is it the ego of a person? Or is this truly impacting the business or not? And so we can start to see, does this stand up to be something that we should actually take a look at? The next is, let's define the problem. Let's come up with a claim or the hypothesis of, I'm seeing this, and therefore, I think the impact is that, right? Then you have to explain why it's true. Let's use fact and figures. Don't use anecdata. It's one of the biggest problems that I see. We take one piece of data and one story and we merge them together to create fear and panic, right? Let's actually go and let's look at the facts and the figures. Then the next thing is, let's actually go get the stories. Let's talk about when this has happened before. And so let's talk about the stories so that we can build the case. And then what's the impact to the company? What specifically is the problem that we're solving for? So when we do these two things together, we know that we have an important problem, and then we start to frame exactly what the problem is, what the facts are, here are the stories specifically that we have seen for it, and then why it's important to the company so that we can then start thinking about the next step, which is going from hypothesis to... Con so we use the problem statement to generate a clear and desired outcome. We have to be really clear. Here's what we'd like to see happen. And so the way we do that is we write a statement that is time bound and tangible. For instance, if I had a turnover problem in my company and I 
for whatever reason, no one was staying. And my turnover rate was 45%, which leads to lower productivity, less connection, less trust, less psychological safety. I might develop some programs around what's going on of why people are not staying at our company. And right, those would be the options that we would need to generate. And my desired outcome would be that within six months, our turnover rate would go from 40 plus percent down to 10% or 5% or whatever the desired outcome is, very specific and time bound, because we want to come back and check in on our decisions. And we're going to talk about evaluating decisions at the end. One of the things that I see that's a problem for companies is they don't generate many options when they're trying to solve problems. We, we end up only having two options and people do a pros and con list. That is a trap because it's to say, well, this is the only option and let's pro and con it or benefits and cost. There are many more options available to you. And so we should try and be exhaustive in that approach. And so there's many roads to get there, many, many roads, but how do we do it? And so you need to generate more than two options. And one of the traps that I see companies get into is, in this case, we allow our previous experiences to impact, oh no, that's not possible. We tried that before, right? When we get into that mode of, we tried that before, well, it was a different time. There's different people in here. The environment has changed. Maybe it was pre-COVID, post-COVID. And so don't fall into the trap of, we've tried that before. If you're doing this yourself and you're trying to brainstorm, there's always going to be blind spots. You know, as much as experience as you have, there's going to be opportunities for us to level up exactly what it is that we're doing. And that's the reason to involve your team, right? We're always better together. And so let's go ahead and involve our team on what it is that we can do. And the last tip that I'll give you is that time is your friend. When we really think about the, the creative problem solving part of our brain, which is the subconscious, we just need to feed the subconscious with, hey, I have this problem. Can you help in the background generate me more options, more things? The power of the subconscious happens when you're in the shower or you're having a quiet moment or a quiet walk and you have that epiphany like, oh, this is the thing that I'm supposed to do. That is your subconscious that's working for you. And so if you can have some time, this is not a problem that needs to be solved immediately. It's not fire that's on, on happening inside your business. Then use your subconscious to give it a little bit of space to breathe. It'll generate more and more options for you. Here's the decision-making rubric that I've modified a little bit, but Clint Rush outlined this for us in episode 44. It's a terrific episode. And I would tell you to go back and listen to it. But once we get to a place of understanding this is important to the company, we have a clear problem, we have a clear outcome, and we've generated options, then we can start to pass it through the rubric of saying, okay, what's the one that we should choose? And so here are the questions that I'd encourage you to come through. You might come up with, because of your industry or your unique you know, decision-making approach, you might have a couple different ones in here, but I think these are pretty good. So I always start out with our North Star items, right? Does it align with our vision? Does it move us closer to where we want to go as a company? Does it align with our values? Or are those things not in concert with one another? If not, we got we to gotta kick that thing out or adjust it so that it's in concert with our values so that we can be one of those really compelling companies. And the third is, does it stand up to our objectives that we're trying to achieve as a company, right? Is it moving those objectives down the road for us? And then we move to, is there one option that's clearly better in the long term? And we think about the long term, I really think about financial considerations, cultural considerations, and infrastructure considerations, right? So when I think about the long-term financial, cultural infrastructure, there might be other ones, right? And so this is something that I'm doing. This is a work in process for me, but I think it's good enough to share at this point in time. And I'd love your feedback if you do have some. The second one is there clearly one that's better in the short term, 
again, thinking about financial, cultural, and infrastructure. The next one that we think about is, can we reverse the decision? If it's a reversible decision and it's still important, let's make the decision at the leadership level, but let's not waste a lot of time on it. We will pick an option, the one that we think is the best, given the amount of information that we have, and we'll get more information because we will move quickly, we will iterate, we'll get feedback on whether it was a good decision or not a good decision, not generating the outcomes that we're looking for. And then we just try again, just iterate, iterate, iterate. Then we think about, can you make a better decision with more time or more information? And if that's true, then we have to go through, is it worth finding that information? I was speaking with the company and they were going to automate a process inside of the company. It was going to cost our programmers a bunch of time and about $20,000 of programming costs to automate the process. And internally, it was an administrative task that took someone about five hours to do. And so over the course of the year, it, it cost us about two to four grand to actually generate this report that was needing to be re generated. So the cost just didn't benefit us enough, right? We just kept it as an administrative task, even though, you know, automating it, yeah, that would have been pretty cool, but just cost benefit didn't make a whole lot of sense there. And then the last piece of this, because we want to be learning organizations, it's the last ring. It is the last link ring of the business acceleration model. We have to communicate so that everyone understands the why of what we're doing, how we got to that decision, because now we're sharing a framework. And then we can all say, okay, interesting. So that's exactly how proven chaos makes decisions. Great. When Jerry's not here, we know how to allocate resources onto opportunities to create success. And that's what we're trying to do as senior leaders. I think it's important too that we have a decision-making philosophy that we communicate. So Nathan Adams, I mentioned him. He was in, in town here in Jacksonville when I had my leadership summit. And he said, you know, I know that I make good decisions. I know I make really fast decisions, but I'm not really sure exactly how I get to make those decisions. I'm just not exactly sure. And so Nathan and I took about a month, just a little bit of time each week, and we helped him develop his decision-making philosophy and his rubric, which he has now successfully communicated to his team, and they are now aligned about how we make it. So Nathan gave me permission to share this. I think this is a great overarching philosophy because when we think about the rubric of best long-term, best short-term, and the decisions in the rubric, this helps us just kind of round that out. So Red Tea is a for-profit real estate development company where managing risks and making informed, fast decisions create success. Every decision should be made through the lens of what creates the best ROI in the long-term. We're focused on the long-term of success or mitigates the most risk, right? And so when you're in a a world where you're working on multi-million dollar developments, land acquisitions, you have to have first mover advantages and aligned on all of those things. And so that's the overarching philosophy. So our leadership team goes, okay, got it. Then we provide a little bit more context for people. So Nathan likes to make fast decisions. That's his bias, right? And so we make fast decisions, then iterate if we aren't getting the desired result. So it's okay, we wanna fail fast. So this requires our leadership team to be clear and employees to be agile and nimble and not married to direction or decisions. So just think about that for a second, right? That also impacts our hiring because we need people whose mindsets are agile and nimble and able to, make different decisions at different points in time. We also don't mind getting it wrong along the path to getting it right. We think that's just part of the process. And so we have a bias for action. Action is more important than inaction because it's providing feedback to get us on the right path. So again, we're going to fail for fast forward and that's okay. I think I said that wrong. We're going to be failing forward fast. That's hard to say. And then the last piece of this, a bias for decisions that impact business structure require more consideration. So here's where we're going to pump the brake. Yes, we want to have a bias for really fast decisions. 
However, if it impacts vision, values, culture, or infrastructure, we're going to take our time with that decision because we think that's impacting the soul of the business. And so as Nathan explained it, a $20,000 decision impacting a single development project is not the same as making a $20,000 decision, $20, decision on what CRM we might use inside the company because that impacts infrastructure and how we do business. The other one is a single decision, it's 20 grand and we move on. So that's where we're going to move fast. But when it comes to vision, values, culture, and infrastructure, that's when we're going to pump the brakes and be a little bit more considered. I think this is a really terrific overarching decision-making philosophy that Nathan's come up with. And I also think his team has really appreciated the clarity that this has given them to say, oh, well, this is how we make decisions. Because as we went through the process with Nathan, I also had his senior leadership team send me three decisions that he had made recently where they were confused by it. And they were really good ones. And as we walked through it, Nathan said, oh, I didn't realize they were confused by that. And then was able to walk through the decision. And that's how we came up with the rubric in doing this. And so it is a really effective tool to make your senior leadership aligned in how we can do this better and better and better. Okay. Once we have the decision, so we've taken it, it's important, clear problem, clear outcome that we're looking for. We've generated options. We've taken it through the, the rubric. We've gotten to a chosen decision. Fantastic. We're in on the decision. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick two people on your team that are going to be in that skeptic role, the devil's advocate, if you will. And their single job is to shoot holes into the decision. Where is every point of failure? And this comes from the military, that someone, when the military makes a decision, there's a team that says, okay, if we were on the other side of this decision, here's how we would infiltrate your decision. It's the same concept inside of your business. We want these two people to determine every point of failure so that we can improve the plan. Every point from like an execution, a clarity, a communication point of view, everything that might go into it. And this will help us to hone and refine that decision to be super considered and the most effective decision that we can make. One thing that we don't do very often inside companies is we don't stop to consider the key decisions that we're making. And so what I'd like you to consider as part of this process is start recording key decisions. Because if we're going through this process and we're being thoughtful in our approach, and then we can see the outcomes that happen, we should be able to use this framework to make better and better decisions that happen faster and faster and faster. And so if you were going, going to go ahead and record key decisions, here's what I would tell you to record. And I'm just imagining this in a Word document for you. We're going to say what specifically was the problem we were trying to solve, right? We had to define that as part of this framework. What's our expected outcome? If we do this, we're going to do this. I think you've heard me say before, business is just one big science experiment. It's a high hypothesis. Here are our var variables. Here's the conclusion. And the better we get at running these hypotheses to conclusions, the better off we're going to be and be successful inside of our company. The next is who owned the decisions? Uh, I could see inside some companies, at least certain companies that I work with, people keeping track of who's making better decisions. And I can see a scoreboard inside some, some businesses. I'd also want to know who are the supporters on that, right? Who's working really well together? And then specifically saying, what were the assumptions that we used to make the decision? So as we walk through the decision-making rubric, what were the things that we said, oh, here's why we thought this was the best long-term consideration, or we stopped on the best short-term because we thought about these three things and the impact that it was going to make. What influenced the decision? Was there a certain market decision? Was there a customer problem? What were the things that you were thinking about when you were making that decision? 
I'd also make sure that I communicate who needs to know about the decision. One of the real problems inside businesses, we're not thoughtful about the intersections of our business. So we will see production make a change and they will not understand how that impa impacts finance and accounting. And so we need to make sure that, hey, if we make this change and this decision, who do we have to communicate with to make sure that we're not messing up their world? Oh, I didn't realize that finance was using the report that we're no longer going to generate for them. What other options were considered, right? I think it's super important as we do this. And Annie Duke has written two books about decision-making. Annie Duke is a, is a champion poker player. And so we, we just have to think about, hey, if I'm in the hand and a po poker hand and I have three aces, there's a really good probability that I'm going to win that hand. So I'm pushing all in. But, you know, they have this, this term called a bad beat. And so sometimes someone else is going to come up with a full house. That doesn't mean that you made a bad decision. It just means that, hey, someone, the market forces were against us on that one. What risks and safeguards were considered, right? Let's make sure that we're thinking about mitigating risk all of the time. And then the last piece is, what's the expected timeline? I, I come back to when we were thinking about generating what the outcome looked like. We want to say that within six months, we're doing this thing. It allows us to then go back and to look and say, did it really happen within six months? How does it look? And I think the two things that we have to assess, because we always assess the outcome of it. We always assess the outcome of the decision. But let's look at the decision process that we went through. Did we do a good job generating options? Did we do a good job choosing the end result? Did we do a good job defining the problem? Because we can have a really good decision that results in a bad outcome. Again, you know, going all in with three aces, it's probably a high probability decision. Getting beat with a full house, that's a good decision with a bad outcome. And so don't just assess outcomes. Let's also look at the quality of our decisions. And then obviously the last piece of that, what would we do differently as we look at this decision? Would we have done something pre-decision as we were trying to make the decision? In the actual decision, geez, one of the other options, we, we made a mistake, that was a better option for us. Or was the problem in the execution of it? And so when we are ruthlessly evaluating these things, again, the goal is how do we move our company forward with more clarity? All of these things help. So that's the decision-making framework. I think that one's really good. We will put our slides up. I'm going to continue to push all of you into a space of generating your own frameworks. I was talking to Greg Rosner this morning, one of the managing partners at one of my companies. He is working really hard. His quarterly objective for himself as the, as the managing partner is to literally write the rules of the game for his organization. And I love that because, you know, when values are clear, decisions are easy. When frameworks are in place, we ease that leadership burden. And at the end of the day, scaling and speed are possible when the rules of the game are clear. It just lifts that weight off of us. So your frameworks, I'm going to leave you with this. Are they written? Are they clear? Are they easy to understand so that they're teachable? And it, is it easy to track? And so those are the things that we want to be thinking about as you generate frameworks. I hope you found this super interesting. Looks like Isaiah Rosick might have a question. You can take your off. No, you're just playing with your dog. It's a big dog, a great Dane, a great Dane. Sorry, Isaiah, good to see you here today. But as you do this, we get clearer and clearer about how we can run our companies and to be more successful whether it's at the senior leadership level, whether it's the departmental level. When we have these rules of the game, everything just moves. It's like lubrication for your department. It's the most magical thing that happens. Give people the gift of explaining how we operate and here's how we win as a company, as a department, as a division, whatever it is that your leadership responsibility takes you to. So I hope this was helpful to you. I know it was really fun for me to put together 
because I think that decision making is arguably the most important aspect of leading companies, leading people, because the quality of your company is going to be directly tied to the quality of the decisions that you make. So fun stuff. Now, listen, next week we have Matt Kleinrock. He is the COO of Rockway Exhibits. I've gotten to know Matt over the last four years, maybe five years. He is a high energy guy. He is not short on energy or opinions. He has a very distinct way that he thinks, and I certainly love him for that. And so next week, he'll drop in. We'll have a conversation with him, and I'm looking forward to that one. I hope all of you have a great Thursday, and we'll catch you next week.